Hello, my friends. Are we running? Yeah, we're running. Boy, it's been a day. Welcome back to you all for this new broadcast. And good to be back home in Colorado Springs. It's been doing fine, but it's been a day. Two or three trips to August, uh, excuse me, uh, Office Depot to my little uh, personal family like geek squad of Jenna and Mikey. They see a lot of me. Nothing wrong with the equipment, ever. It's, what's that phrase? The devil's in the details. So, yeah, it took a couple hours to get things on, online here. Listen, I'm going to ask you to do something for me. Uh, I'm thinking, especially of my prayer team, Roslyn, Marsha, Linda, Robin, Mark, uh, and several, Ashana. Kathy, Susan, those of you who pray regularly for me, uh, I want you to I want you to do this. Starting uh, at sunset on Friday, the beginning of Shabbat, and ending sunset Saturday, the end of Shabbat. I want you guys to keep me in prayer. This isn't fear talking. This is just practical necessity. Uh, that that window of when I do my final edits and put these things online is, is, is quite interesting. So, uh, yeah, just do that. Let me open in prayer and we'll get going. Father, I thank you and praise you uh, that you cause all things to work together for good to those who are called according to your purpose and who love you. Um, I love you and I'm called according to your purpose. So I praise you that you've already turned this thing around. Jenna needed a lot of encouragement on the way back. Ran into a just a precious but broken down little young lady named Crystal with her puppy, homeless, uh, in tears, kind of yelling at the sky, everything going wrong. I was able to pull over, uh, grab her hand, say a prayer for her, and slip her 10 bucks. I'm not boasting on me. I'm just saying that's the way you work. You turn a problem into a blessing. So I expect good things today. Holy Spirit, you're the boss. Always, always, always. You're the master teacher, please touch my words even the tone of my voice, with the purposes of Almighty God. Make this thing, I was going to say fly. <laughs> I'll stay with that. In Jesus' name, amen. Title of our message today. I changed it a little bit. A lot of audibles. I think of Peyton Manning all the time, uh, watching him win the Super Bowl. He must have called Omaha, Omaha, about 42 times. I love Peyton Manning. I uh, miss him. Uh, so I call some audibles as well. I do some last minute changing of titles, tweaking, that sort of thing. A little bit of a difference this time. Notes on the punishment of false teachers and prophets. Confronting the spirit of, I originally had confronting the spirit of Judas, but I switched it over in the last 48 hours. I think you'll see why. Confronting the spirit of Ananias and Sapphira in the American church. Blessed be the reading of the word that I'm going to bring forth now. The scripture for today is long. I won't teach on the whole thing, but I want to set it up and give you a very rich context. This is a hard teaching in the sense that we're not touching about frothy, frilly, warm, and fuzzy little things. I hardly talk about those things anymore. What I like to talk about is truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to so help us God. And since we're living in difficult times, I think sometimes it's more than justified and required to talk about tough truth, to prepare us for tough times. The silk soft, silky soft stuff doesn't do a thing for us. Anyway, uh, here's the scripture from Deuteronomy 13, first five verses. Bear with me. This is being read in the New King James, which is my personal favorite. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you. We'll come back to that. To know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him only, and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. Last paragraph. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, this is hard, but that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death 
because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall put away the evil from your midst. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Key terms we'll skip until a little bit later. Quotation is from Mark Hitchcock in a book called The Coming Apostasy, Exposing the Sabotage of Christianity from Within. Here's what he writes in 2017. The greatest danger to the... I could not agree more strenuously with this man. The greatest danger to the church today is not humanism, paganism, atheism, or agnosticism. The greatest danger is not increasing hostility against our faith from all those liberals out there. It's not the greatest threat. The greatest danger is not increasing hostility against our faith from the culture, but our greatest danger is apostasy on the inside arising from false teachers, theological liberals. Don't let that term throw you. Those who call themselves conservative today are die-hard, at-core, blood-and-marrow liberals, theologically. Theological liberals who deny and distort biblical doctrine and lead others down the same path. Here's the deal, Under, underlying the theme today. If you're a teacher, you're a pastor, you're an evangelist, you're a church leader, you're an elder, you're a group leader, you're a youth pastor, you are just leading small groups in your home of about five people. Your responsibility isn't chartable, statistically speaking. Speaking, It's that large, that heavy a weight, and that important. That's the underlying theme here. I'm talking to all of us who are in the house of faith, but primarily, again, and this is not just me always directing me to go after pastors and preachers and leaders and teachers and priests. He's... You know, I'll go on record. He's the one who keeps pushing me in this direction. He's concerned about you because you touch so many other lives. Now, if he can touch you in a positive way by maybe scaring the hell out of you every now and then, he can draw you back in, and then you can help all those people you proclaim that you're helping now. I have a definition here of liberal theology. I won't read it all. The idea of liberal theology is nearly three centuries old. The starting point of theological liberalism is that it trades the external, objective, God-given standard of the Bible in matters of faith for an individual's personal, subjective opinion and experience or emotions. I feel like it exchanges objectivity for subjectivity. I'll say more about that in another teaching in a couple of weeks when I deal with postmodernism. This is an exact inversion of the Christian faith. Beloved, this is what I see in American Christianity today. Christianity turned upside down and inside out by doctrines and philosophies I've named week after week for about three years now. First thoughts. So I'm going to begin this commentary in a rather unusual way this time. Um... The first uh, quotation was from, again, Mark Hitchcock, and the second one from, uh, not Thomas Wolfe, but uh, William Wolfe. They're both Christians. They're both conservatives. They're both, uh, their rap sheets, <laughs> in a positive sense of that term, read like, you know, uh, right out of the, uh, right out of the book, of, book of Faith. But let me show you something about the differences that exist in the body of Christ today in the so-called conservative camp. Here are bios of each one, very brief. Number one, bio note number one, Mr. Hitchcock is senior pastor of Faith Bible in Edmond, Oklahoma, associate professor of Bible Expo Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary, and author of over 30 end-time related books. He holds the JD degree, he's a lawyer, God help him, from Oklahoma City University Law School and the PhD in theology from Dallas Theological. He has recently written extensive warningly, extensively warning about a second American revolution. 
Although he is a classic old-school theological conservative, he remains increasingly a distinct minority voice in the American church today. Let's go to bio note number two, Mr. Wolf. Ten-year veteran of the conservative political movement, has served as senior official in the Trump administration, both as a deputy assistant secretary of defense at the Pentagon and a director of legislative affairs at the Department of State. Prior to his service in the administration, he worked for the Heritage Foundation, the Heritage Action for America, and as a congressional staffer for three different members of Congress, all Republican conservatives, including the former Representative Dave Bratt. He has a BA in history from Covenant College and a Master's of Divinity at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He is currently preparing to work on a PhD with a focus on Christian ethics and public theology, enter pastoral ministry, and engage at the intersection of faith and politics in America. He would be fairly characterized as a loyal advocate of Trump's Christian nationalism, and he represents a majority voice in the American church today. Sometimes when I'm frustrated, I resort to Spanish. ¿Estás recibiendo esto, amado? Are you getting this a little bit, my friends? Are, are you seeing the drift here? They've been trying to lay out week after week. I know I repeat myself. Who is it? Lewis B. Carroll said, what I tell you three times is true. That's a pretty close to a biblical concept. Sometimes it needs repeating. But I wanted to point out the stark divide in a very detailed way that exists in the conservative theological camps of America. We're split in half. And there's this tiny little voice down here, down here in, in the basement, represented by Mr. Hitchcock. And there's this clarion call up here on the surface, represented by Mr. Wolf, that, that, that truly, truly describes where the American church is today. And truly describes, well, we'll have another Donald Trump of some kind in office again and again and again and again. I don't think there's three agains. I think there's one more again left. But that's just me. What do I know? And by the way, I gave up two names to these two camps. The traditional conservatives on the true Christian center right, not the extreme right. And the Trump conservatives on the left. That's where you belong. That's where you belong. Case study, it's not in the text. Watch Ron DeSantis and try to call him a conservative anymore, especially after his remarks about black Americans who were enslaved. I mean, the ground is shifting. The axis of the earth may be shifting, but I tell you what, the ground, political, spiritual, philosophical, theological, is shifting at magnitude 9.0 at this point. So this dramatically illustrates the deep structured chasm that now exists in the American church today. And it promises, I hate to keep saying it, but the more I read, the more I pray, the more I reflect, just the more I watch. If we're not headed towards civil war, we're headed towards something very close to it. We're beginning to hate each other the way we did in 1855, 6, 7, 8, 9. American against American. And yet, with all of this tumult, with all of, with, with all of this just anecdotal evidence, you don't have to go to the research journals or the internet. I mean, the evidence for these chasms, these divides, is all around us. It's in our household, it's in our families. Sometimes it's inside of us and we're split between two opinions. Yet our unforgivably timid church, unforgivably Timid church, why do I say that? Because you won't address it. There's a quote, I don't have it in the text again, by Martin Luther hundreds of years ago that essentially said, if a pastor is preaching the entire gospel, start to finish, Genesis to Revelation, and does so well and does so perfectly, nearly perfectly, if he is not addressing that flashpoint where truth is confronted by 
deception and evil. He is not preaching the gospel at all. I submit most of you are not preaching the gospel at all. you bits and pieces and shards and, you know, parts of the puzzle that are pleasing enough that won't make your people upset. Hannah Arendt is a hero of mine, very controversial German-Jewish political scientist, brilliant, who wrote, among other things, a concept about other things, uh, as the concept of the banality of evil comes from Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil in 1963. She was trying desperately as a Jew, as an intellectual, as a scientist, to come to terms with what could possibly explain what happened in otherwise sophisticated, spiritually intact, uh, beautiful in every way, Weimar Germany in the 1920s. Here's a quote. This, the answer will surprise you. Shook up the uh, Jewish world, still does. She's very controversial. Opinions are split about her. I like what she wrote a lot. Here's why. Just a snippet. Here's what she said after years of study and exhaustive research and talking to people. Evil ultimately comes from the failure to think. I think that's so brilliant it ought to be etched in stone almost above every Christian and Jewish household. Evil comes fundamentally from a failure to think. It defies thought for as soon as thought tries to engage itself with evil and examine the premises and principles from which it originates, which normal healthy people will do, Jewish, Christian, atheist, agnostic. There are people in our community online that do it and they aren't Christians, but they're very thoughtful, deeply thoughtful. But it is frustrated because it finds nothing there. That is the banality of evil. That is, people just shut down. I don't want to deal with this. Beloved, that's in the church. It's in the pulpit. I've heard it. Sorry to yell, sort of. I have heard it said in a hundred different ways. Don't worry about it. Yeah, it's terrible out there. Don't think about it. Don't listen to the news. Don't pay attention to it. Just, you know, hunker down in your little Christian hovel with a few friends and Christian books from your local Christian bookstore. Turn on Christian music. Have Christian accoutrement throughout the house. Scriptures hanging from every single dial and light and, and hanger. And, and just don't worry about all that. I haven't got a label for that, that I can say in public. People stopping things. Have you ever engaged a so-called Christian on the other side of this chasm? Tried to reason with them, you bring evidence, you bring scripture, you bring commentary, your voice isn't loud like mine sometimes gets, it's measured, it's even respectful, and what do you get in return? Nothing rational. Nothing rational. Just what they feel. So much of the time, the majority of the time. So this is where we are, beloved, at the what I call the mortal crossroad of historic indifference to evil. That's what I see in the church. I do. I'm a professionally trained observer. Strong social theory, sociological background. I know how to observe in coffee shops. I know how to read the charts in the academic journals. I, I've done this for a lifetime. This is what I do. This is my wheelhouse. Or as the young people say, this is my jam, Dr. Kelly. It's what I do. It's what I am. The German Reich went to these same places, beloved, with abominable consequence. And so I say bluntly, should America continue down this same brutally dark road, her homework assignment that I may give today may well become a required big screen, screen viewing <coughs> of the Hughes Brothers apocalyptic The Book of Eli, starring our beloved Denzel Washington. 
That's where this is going. The apocalypse. That's where it's going. Jesus said it would. The prophet said it would. The apostle said it would. But I never believed it until just the last few years. I mean, I didn't believe it would be in my time. Second section, the legacy of Ananias and Sapphira. I'm watching my time. I'm reading from Acts 5, 1 through 11. The text teaches itself. Because we're entering a time of Ananias and Sapphira. I'm convinced of it. It started during COVID when all these anti-vaccine dudes on radio, they all died. A number of them. I uh, don't have their names. You can look it up online. But there was a certain man named Ananias who with his wife Sapphira sold some property. He bought part of the money. He brought part of the money to the apostles claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit. And you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours. To sell or not sell, that's no problem, as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife comes in, not knowing what had happened to her husband. Peter asked her, was this the price you and your husband received for your land? She, yes, she, she, she replied that, that that was the price, a lie. And Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this. The young men, excuse me, the young men who buried your husband are just outside the door and they will carry you out too. Instantly, she fell to the floor and died. This is New Testament stuff, boys and girls, not OT. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband in great fear gripped the church, the entire church, and everyone else who heard about what had happened. By the way, I didn't even go into it. The theologians are still shouting at each other, well, did they go to heaven or don't, did they go to hell? <laughs> I'm going to talk about Pascal's wager as I close today. I would bet on the severer, more conservative conclusion if I were you. The commentary, this time I'll just read snippets because it's long from, did I not put the name down again? Oh, this is, uh, yeah, Reverend Chris Shelton, pastor of First Presbyterian Church of Union in a piece called Getting the Message uh, about this passage. The judgment was not, I'm just going to read the main points. The judgment was not because of the, moment, the amount of money they gave. It was their money, they could do whatever they wanted with it. They were free to do their properties they chose. In verse 4, the judgment was from the lie, the misrepresentation. Read Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 four times before you go to bed tonight. God hates lying. Let me tell you something. If you continue to be an inveterate liar, God will come to hate you. I know your pastor would never say such a thing. Lightning should strike me right through the ceiling. God doesn't hate. He just loves everybody all the time. For, you know, he just love. What the Beatles say? Love is all you need. They were a liar. They were a collective liar. Love isn't all you need. It sure helps, but it ain't the whole story. They are contrasted with Barnabas in chapter 4, who was so named by the apostles for his service to the church. He gave his proceeds for the sale of his property, just like he said he would. That's not the amount. I'm not a 10 percenter. It's not the amount. It's the truthfulness and the motive of heart. I don't know if I should say this. With two, three glaring exceptions, most of the people who are patrons of this ministry, I hate to call it that, I don't feel like a preacher, I'm still a whole stuffy academic, are people with very limited means, with three extraordinary 
generous exceptions. It's not the amount, beloved. It's the motive and the desire. And I would rather have your prayers, frankly, than your money. Ah! Although I can use both, but I'd rather have your prayers at the open. From Friday night to Saturday night, I want your prayers. I mean, I want your prayers. I want militant prayers. I want imprecatory prayers. I want binding and loosening prayers. I want aggressive warfare prayers. I'm not going to go into detail the stuff that happens to me in that 24-hour frame, but let's just have prayer. The sins that stand out here are greed, hypocrisy, and lying. And God hates every single one of those. Greed, hypocrisy, and lying. The greed of the couple in this story is exposed by their hypocrisy. It's, it's not that God so much goes after the liars in the general unsaved culture, but when it's happening among his own people, when it's happening from the pulpit, that by ignoring glaring desperate need and not turning toward it, that is the form of a deception. And God will have his say. He will have his say. Pastor. They conspired to lie to men because they loved the praise of men. Pastors, the best thing you could do, and I've been that way for most of my 40-some years of being a Christian. I, I, I wanted the audience to love me. I, I still want approval, but only from people who are truly in Christ. I don't give a tinker's boop about opinions of me from others. I don't care. I don't care. But for people who are doing their best, as imperfectly as they are, just to serve Christ and, and being honest and straight with me, even when they have to tell me something I don't necessarily want to hear, I love those. I'm, I want to hang with those, and I care about their counsel. But those with a contrary Christian worldview, no, your views of me don't count for a thing, not a thing, any more than they did for Christ or the apostles or the prophets back in their day. Sorry for the comparison. It sounded arrogant, but... I stand with some pretty amazing people in saying what I'm saying. Ananias and Sapphira belonged, by the way, to the very best church. They had the apostles. They had, as their ministers, they saw and heard miraculous things, signs and wonders. They were in a spirit-filled church, and the praise and worship was awesome, and the teaching was rich. And they still screwed up, and they lost their lives. They lost everything! Best church. Best church. So as the Lord directs, he concludes, let us be watchful, ever watchful, with fear and trembling over our souls. I am. I'm fearful every day, especially as a teacher. I worry constantly. Lord, am I being too tough? Am I, am I missing the mark? Am I, I've never taught this way, Lord. What? Every day. I spend hours each morning before the Lord. Make sure I'm mostly on track. Third, the teaching. I won't reread the long scripture. Let's go to a few key concepts and terms. I don't know what time I have left here. <laughs> I'm okay. Sorry. Uh, four key terms. Prophet. What is a prophet? A spokesman, a speaker, a teacher, a prophet, a divinely inspired man, ideally. Called, raised up, or ordained to speak God's words. A person illuminated, such as Moses, Elijah, David, Isaiah, and the rest. An interpreter of God's mind and word. One that explains or communicates sentiments from the Lord. One, on the other hand, who does so but is pretending. He's pretending. We've got these things, I want to say, by the multitudes in the Pentecostal charismatic churches today, especially. God, have you ever gone online and listened to this trash? Testing. This is a really important point. I've brought it up before, but it's, it, it's in the core of the teaching today. You're going through a lot of stuff. I know you are. With tears, I've read your 
comments, your private notes to me, your pleadings for prayer, unprecedented loss and hatred from members of your own family for taking a stand for the Lord. And all the rest of you who aren't being so noble, God is testing us. Every single, this is, this is the kind of the last final, I remember I used to give final exams at the end of the semester. We're entering the time of final exams. Are you passing? Are you passing? Testing from the Hebrew nasa, meaning to attempt to assay, adventure, prove, tempt, or try. It refers to God testing the faith and faithfulness of his people, of all people. Trying for proof, proving by a standard. But as it with an experiment in metallurgy, the operation of refinement by fire to make steel out of an otherwise false alloy. The word entice, nadach, to impel, to thrust, to banish false teachers, pretty pastors. God, I listened to one last night. I wrote him a very tough note. I've written him half a dozen times. He won't listen. I'm, I'm nobody. I'm nobody. I have a PhD and have taught applied theology for 42 years, but I'm nobody. This guy's got a bachelor's degree and he's got a church full of 40,000 people. He's worth $10 million. He's on every TBN broadcast you can find. Biggest church, I think, in Texas. And a young man I led to the Lord 40-some years ago. A brilliant, powerful, anointed, blessed pure-hearted man of God sits under that scoundrel who also sits in a leadership position on Donald Trump's spiritual advisory board. And we've lost friendship. I've asked to meet him more than once. Meet me. Meet me. We'll talk. I don't want to meet you. You'll just get upset with me and, you, you know. Sits under that trash, that bile, every Sunday. I don't know what's going to happen to him. He's 10,000 times purer and more holy than I am by every standard, but he's drinking poison every Sunday. Finally, hardest lesson of all. This is, this is a tough path. Well, Dr. Kelly, that's Old Testament. Mm -hmm. I'll address that in a minute. To put away, ba'ar in the Hebrew, from a, word, word, from a root word meaning brutish, those who are stupid and ignorant of God, to kindle, to burn, to consume by fire or eating, to completely waste or utterly destroy, banish, purge, to cleanse or purify by separating, totally carrying off all that is impure, foreign or superfluous as to purge the body by evacuation to clear from guilt or moral defilement. God wants his houses cleared, purified, cleaned up. He wants them cleaned up, Pastor. And you're the guy that he raised up to do it. But so far you have not. Your motives between you and God. Money, fear, unbelief, arrogance. I don't know, but he does. But he does. And he's already been knocking on your door. I'd open it if I were you, because if you do, compliance and obedience and confession and repentance, I promise you, leads to an ocean, an ocean of new beginnings and peace and prosperity in the spiritual sense and joy and the enmity of men. Commentary. Moses had cautioned against the peril that might arise from the Canaanites. Here he cautions against the rise of idolatry among themselves as the Canaanites interbred and came into the Jewish community. Same thing's happening in the church. It's already happened. I've stated you statistics week after week after week. I can repeat them again and again. 66 million QAnons. 66 out of 300 and 40, 50 million Americans, 66 million documented, two different surveys, QAnon, millions of them sitting in the pews, a few thousand, 
preaching from the pulpit. QAnon. We may expect the Matthew Henry, the commentator, goes on to expect in this particular hour to be proved by temptations of evil. You're being tested, you're being proved by fire. Will you hang on to Christ and the canon or to your friends? To your family. I'm not saying leave your family. I'm just saying, with whom will you stand doctrinally and in the conduct of your life? Christ or your companions? To the question, how severe a punishment then does the New Testament canon permit or require against unrepentant, rebellious, false teachers, prophets, and pastors who refuse year after year after year of warning? To repent. Well, this is the New Testament, Dr. Kelly. God's a loving God. He, you know, I'm covered. It's okay. I mess up, but it's okay if I don't address what I know he's asking me to address. It's okay. I'm in the door. Are you? Skip over my diatribe against OSAS. Once saved, always saved, except to this to say this, you can read the details. When Augustine and later Calvin constructed the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, basically, it's, it's, it's a mis, mistitled, misnomer. Basically, the, the idea is this. As long as you're saved, as long as you say the prayer and you've tasted of the Holy Spirit and you're covered by the blood, it does not matter what you do, think, or say after it presumes, it presupposes that it's, it's, it's like an automaton. There's a mechanical algorithm that you could just never go that far outside of the canon ever again. Free will is, is neutered. There is no free will. You're in. It's all God now. You don't have to, I remember sitting with a rank Calvinist. I won't mention his name. He's a lovely man in every way. Knocking back his bruise and his brewskis. And no, you won't go to hell necessarily for drinking a beer, but you will go there if you're a drunk. And uh, I said, you know, I sort of say his name, I don't want to do that. Are you, you know, do you, you know, you're a leader of students, young people, you're, you know, are you setting the best example? There's a church that just opened up, I read about two weeks ago, and you go and have cocktails and talk about Jesus. His answer was telling. You know, everything I do now is ordained. He's a, what do you call him, tulips, five-pointer. Everything I do is okay. Everything I do is okay. No, he wasn't out committing adultery or robbing banks. There is no free will anymore. There's no freedom of choice. All the scriptures from Old to New Testament about choose wisely are lies. So how severe, how severe can it get for a believer and especially a pastor? Given the passages I've already read. 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3. This is New Testament. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destruct, destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on them who denying the Lord who bought them with what? With his blood. Peter said this. And bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words for a long time. Their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber, beloved. A representative interpretation of what I see as an unmistakable doctrine is offered once again by John Gill, who wrote in 1746, before they forgot the canon. And their damnation slumbereth not, 
and avenging God who has appointed them to damnation for their sins slumbers not. He hasn't gone to sleep, beloved. The justice of God does not sleep. It's just not talked about anymore in the American church because it doesn't feel good nor careless and negligent, but is awake and watches over them to bring the evil upon them they have deserved and worked hard for, and is in reserve for them, and will hasten to perform it. The determined destruction does not lie dormant, Mr. Gill writes, but in a little time will be stirred up and fall with dreadful weight on such sinners as may be concluded from the following awful instances. I offer a codicil at this point. My own idea. After decades-long dilution and watering down of the gospel and ruination of the word of God in America over the past 50 years and more, at least 50, I was reminded as I wrote this piece of a passage that now takes on for me, and I hope for you, an unnerving yet necessarily loving remembrance. It's from... Hebrews 13.8 and Malachi 3.6. Again, I join the Old with the New Testament canon because they're in perfect symmetry. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, the same today, and the same forever. Therefore, he does not change, beloved. Nor shall the sons of obedience, therefore, be consumed. You are safe. You are eternally secure if you are motivated by a heart toward obedience, mistakes and failings all along the way, and have a confession that is open and transparent with the Lord, when you blow it in a bad way, God, I'm sorry, we got to go at this again. That's all he needs, beloved. But he will not countenance a liar, a deceiver, uh, uh, one who will say, God, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to deal with that. I'm not going to, I'm talking about a saved Christian leader. I'm not going to deal with that because, you know, that's, that's not what you raised me up to deal with. All I want to do is just preach the gospel, you know, and just stay right there. I don't want to address any of that. They said in Germany a century ago, over and over and over again, by the millions, Protestants, Catholics, until a little shaver of a church raised up by the efforts and the prayers and the agonies of Dietrich Bonhoeffer and two or three others that I've talked about before and started the Confessing Church. Now, the Confessing Church had several thousand members when it began. By the time the war ended and Hitler was dead and the Holocaust had already wiped out six to eight million lives, there was a handful left. Bonhoeffer was not among them because he happened to have been caught by the Nazis in a plot against Hitler and was hanged naked in the public square by piano wire for all to see. So to all the false teachers out there, the charlatans, the ones joined to the dark spirits of political antichrist and rebellion and brutality and mammon and power and position and fame, Indeed, to all who have fallen catastrophically short, yet who refuse to repent, the word of God promises the consequences to you of Ananias and Sapphira, very possibly. Not all. Depends on what's in your heart. I'm not God. I'm not the judge. I just report his words. He's the one who decides. I'm just waving as many red flags as I can because I don't want you to burn. And I don't want you, Pastor, to take tens of thousands with you. You're not above the law. Christ fulfilled the law, but he is the living law. You are not above him. You are not protected by unmitigated grace when you remain unrepentant. In rebellion, sustained, seven years now. Seven years, interesting number. The number of completion. So the gamble, I told you I was going to close with Blaise Pascal's famous wager. Should you for some inexplicable, inexplicable reason dare to disbelieve the very words of Christ here 
and dare further to take a more liberal interpretation of the passages I've cited from both Old and New Testament, equally severe for false teachers, I remind you of Blaise Pascal's wager. And I quote from Liz Jackson's summary of it, Assistant Professor of Department of Philosophy at Ryerson University, January 4th, 2021. Pascal thought that evidence cannot settle the question of whether God exists. You can't necessarily prove, although I think the evidence everywhere demands a, a positive verdict, but I get her point as a philosopher. So he proposes that you should bet, you should wage a bet on God. The reason being very simple. What if God is true and his words are true and what I presented to you today is pretty much true, wouldn't you be better and wiser and more secure to bet on God and not on the forces of Antichrist and QAnon and MAGA nationalism and the prosperity gospel and hyper-grace theology and dominionism. And wouldn't you be better to stay over here, beloved? Pastor, wouldn't you be better to preach this and only this and warn people, not necessarily the way I do, in your own way, about this? Start doing it. Redeem yourself and rescue your people. So do I counsel us all to bet on God's truth, whether I presented it well or not, you read it for yourself, do your own work. <clears throat> and this rather than on the vicissitudes and philosophies of men, the lure of the so easy American gospel that makes me want to vomit, nor especially on the serpentine hisses of the abominable lawless one. He's already at least his spirit is. He's everywhere. And he's in the church. How about we get him out? Father, I thank you and praise you. I didn't mean to get so worked up. I never do. Came in here in a pretty good mood. Enjoying your grace once again to take a number of glitches and turn them into something rather wonderful. But my candle burns hot, Lord hotter than ever in my almost 80 years. I used to say I don't know why, but I do know why. I do know why, sir. And I'm not even saying it's always right to express it, but I'm telling you, Lord, one thing I am not ever going to be again is lukewarm about these life and death matters inside the house. I pray in the name of Jesus that something I said or the way that I said it or quoted or disclosed will appeal to our church leaders please please god not by might zechariah 4 6 nor by power nor by persuasive efforts of men but by your spirit lord by your spirit and word go into the inner chambers of men's hearts that stand in pulpits week after week month after month year after year and have become afraid insulated against what they Lord really requires of them. I'm reminded of that great passage. Oh, what does the Lord want and require of us but to do justice, to do it, Lord, speak it, live it, do justice, then love mercy and walk humbly before our God. That's what he requires more than ever before. I love you, Lord. I'm sorry for my excesses when they're not inside your boundaries, but I will not apologize for the passion ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you all. I hope this helps. I hope that it encourages. And by the way, concerning the graphic, I labored and labored and labored over it. And I settled on the one that I think said it most plainly that needs no explanation. Love you. Talk to you soon. There'll be a series of Precy this coming week, as I promised.